Hello. We are about to get started. I think we, yeah, it's noon now, so we can go ahead and start. Welcome to the second South Talk. My name is Katie McKee, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture here on the campus of the University of Mississippi. But like all things that happen at the center, there is a team of people making things work. So we want to especially thank Afton Thomas, who is the Associate Director for Programs and who organizes the South Talk series, and Rebecca Cleary, who helps us advertise these and has, through those advertisements, brought you to us today. This year at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, we are focusing on Mississippi Voices. We had a great event last night in the Ford Center, Voices of Mississippi, based on the box set by William Ferris that allowed us to hear some wonderful music, see a lot of photographs, and celebrate the creative spirit of Mississippians. Today, we are turning to more Mississippians, continuing our investigation of Mississippi voices. My job is to introduce the introducer. So I'm gonna do that and then get out of the way. We're really happy to have Sarah Pinion with us today, who is the Assistant Director for Programming at the Center for Inclusion and Cross-Cultural Engagement here on the University of Mississippi campus. One thing that we are really proud of at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture is our desire to partner with other folks on campus and people in the broader community. So we particularly celebrate opportunities to collaborate with the Center for Inclusion and Cross-Cultural Engagement. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Take it away. Thank you so much, Katie. I'm really happy to be here with everyone. So I am very excited to be introducing to you our speaker for this talk today, uh, Dr. Tammy Greer. Uh, Dr. Greer is a member of the United Huma Nation and director of the Center for American Indian Research and Studies, CARES, at Southern Mississippi. Dr. Greer has worked with Southeastern Native tribal members on numerous projects, including the formation of the Center for American Indian Research Studies. The Southern Mississippi Powwow a 1,000 square foot medicine wheel garden located on campus for whom she is the caretaker and is currently addressing the preventable chronic diseases in our Southeastern native tribes in a more holistic way using the traditional teachings of the sacred medicine wheel. She is the faculty advisor for the Golden Eagles Intertribal Society, a native focused student group on campus who along with the Center for American Indian Research and Studies tends the garden, co-hosts the yearly powwow, and organizes two Native Ways school day events each year. We are excited to have her with us today, um, and please give a strong virtual welcome to Dr. Tammy Greer. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Tammy. Go for okay, it. Thank you. <laughs> I want to start um, with a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land where I'm located, the land upon which the Hattiesburg and Gulf Park Southern Miss campuses are built. I want to honor the unnamed ancestors who were the first to walk these pine hills and this Gulf Coastal Plain, those whose origin and migration stories, medicine and plant knowledge are of this particular place. I offer my respect to the living descendants of those people and to those who still occupy this territory as a sovereign nation, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. And I want to acknowledge the ancestral territories of the Chickasaw peoples of where you all are today. This is my friend Pearlie's social dance crew and my kids dance with her kids. So my kids are up in there somewhere as well. When Joe Bohannon asked me to be co-advisor for the Golden Eagles in a Tribal Society, which was a native focused student group that he organized and to help out with the powwow that he started, I agreed to help him out because I know that natives are less than 2% of the US population. And according to the National Congress of American Indians, Native Americans account for about half a percent of full-time faculty. So there aren't many of us in these university positions to help out. I didn't really think about it, but Joe was a graduate student, which meant within a couple of years he'd be leaving, which meant, you know, like that. 
And then he asked me what I wanted to bring to the organization, to the campus, in order to make it a better place for natives, to bring a native presence to the campus. And I didn't really know what I wanted to bring to the organization. I hadn't really thought about it. But what I do know and what I did know is that powwows come and powwows go, and we really needed a constant presence on the campus. I recalled to him that I'd heard elders talking about us losing our plant knowledge and forgetting the names of our original, in our original languages of our plants. And so I told him that I thought maybe we should have a native plant garden. We were visioning a place where elders could come and recall the names of the plants and teach the youth about native plants, plants that our ancestors used as building materials like tala or palmetto, weapons like whiskey or cane, medicines like itishuna or supplejack, dyes like koshiba or pokeweed, and food like sako or muscadines that are ripe right now, drinks like yopan or asi, and basket material like oak shulba or coral honeysuckle like that. And we were visioning a place where we could learn from our plant brothers and sisters, even though really neither one of us knew very much about native plants. Really, we didn't know anything about growing native plants. But we did know that these southeastern native plants allowed our ancestors to survive and thrive for thousands of years. It turns out that we human beings were some of the last to emerge. So we're literally the little brothers and sisters amongst most all our relatives. Most all plants and animals were here long before us. They've survived for much longer than we have. And as our elders, we can learn from them just as we can learn from all our elders. They know how to live on this earth, how to live in relationship with other diverse beings around them. They sacrifice themselves for us and for other beings as food and medicine and building materials and weapons and dyes. And we really have to respect that and respect them. Joe brought a photo from a book of a, to me of a garden in the shape of a medicine wheel. And we all agreed, the whole group, that that should be the shape for the garden. So we decided to outline the wheel with stones and I knew that in forming that shape, the sacred medicine wheel, and by including our elder brothers and sisters, the plant relatives, and not only the plant relatives, but the ancient ones, the stones, red and yellow ochre used to paint our bodies, used by Osceola, Osceola, the black drink crier, to cover his body at his death so that he would leave this world in the same way he came in, half bloody by including the 60 million year old seashells that were deposited in Mississippi when all of Mississippi was part of the ocean, by including lava rocks that we use in our sweats. I knew that we were creating a sacred space on our campus. So we began this garden in that way, by paying our respects to the ancestors, to the ancient ones, and to those in the spirit world who loved and cared for these plants as they were cared for themselves by these plants. We were imagining as well a place where natives could come and realize that there was room for them here. There was a space, an undeniably native space, where folks could visit and learn about native ways. We wanted a space that our students, but not only our students, the greater community members, and not only them, but a space where everyone could come and learn about the southeastern, the particularly southeastern native experience. Our plants, our traditions, our ways, and it was a huge dream. We wrote a grant and received money from the SEBA Corporation, an organization that funds grassroots projects like this, just a couple thousand dollars, and we began to build a garden. And then Joe, of course, as graduate students do, he graduated and he moved on to a faculty position. And we continued to build our garden because this garden is like us. She's not the same from day to day. She's not the same from season to season. Sometimes she changes dramatically and at other times just a little bit. Our students really got involved when we asked Physical Plant to pave the path so that the garden would be handicapped accessible. We wanted for everyone to be able to enjoy our garden. And we wanted for the paths 
to speak about the Southeastern American Indian experience. We wanted the symbols and the words and the tribal names to speak about the indigenous people of this place. We are the people who were not a part of the forced removal. We remained, hid out, stayed to ourselves, and there's a legacy that results from those particular experiences. Lots of folks think that Southeastern natives no longer exist, that we went extinct. And so we needed this garden to inform and to inspire and to speak to folks about our experiences. Also, we wanted for the youth to connect with their elders. So as we drew these ancient Southeastern symbols into the past, the college students each called their Pokni and asked about Choctaw words for colors and directions and for the names of plants. And they wrote these Choctaw words into the concrete. So when our Southern Miss students walk into the garden, they're greeted with Choctaw words, Halito, Hello, Saco, Muscadine, Tachi, Corn, Lusa, Black. And when our Choctaw students walk into our garden, they're greeted in their own language. And seeing your own language, feeling like you belong here, like there's a place for you, a place for Native students at the university is really important. College is a foreign place for most Native students. In 2019, only 19% of 18 to 24 year old Native American students were enrolled in college, compared to 41% of the overall US population. In 2017, 21% of Native children under 18 years of age lived in a household with a parent who completed a bachelor's degree or higher, compared to 52% of white households. Native Americans comprise only 2% of 1% of the U.S. undergraduate population and less than 1% of the graduate population. These students are often left out of graphs of ethnic and racial differences in educational attainment because of the small sample sizes. We really do need to be more responsive to the specific needs of Native students. We had an indigenous group of gardeners who came the other day to help clean up the rock gardens and the medicine wheel and remove some tree limbs and do some just general housekeeping out there. And one of the gardeners saw her tribal name and she turned to her guy and she said, look, we're here. Our tribe is in this garden. There we are. We're in this garden and that's important. You can see from these graphs that natives are graduating high school at about the same rate as everyone else, but graduating with an associate's degree at about half the rate of white Americans and graduating with a bachelor's degree at about a third of the rate of white Americans. And we didn't even make the chart for a master's degree or higher. And then we colored the paths. She really is a beautiful garden. Medicine will teachings are indigenous teachings that have to do with approaching ourselves, our earth, one another, all our paths, wherever they may lead and whatever the circumstances in a more holistic way with developments occurring in successive passes around the wheel and balance of different aspects fundamental in our journeys to wholeness and wellness and the wholeness and wellness of other beings of our planet. Medicine will teachings are used by different tribes and different organizations to serve numerous purposes, often focused on health and wellness, but also including focuses in diverse areas like mental health and end of life care and leadership and addiction and care for the environment. Different tribes generally have different colors for their directions and may have different teachings about specifically what occurs in those directions. But the holistic aspect and the balance of those aspects are common in medicine wheel teachings. Those are lots of different medicine wheel in their teaching. In our garden, the yellow path faces the eastern direction. It's in the east where the sun rises, where everything comes into existence. The east is where stars and mountains and trees and civilizations and babies and new projects, manuscripts, building plans, paintings, music scores, dance routines, scientific studies, and also relationships are born. We come into this world from the spirit world and our spiritual selves grow and are tended in the East. When we orient ourselves towards what's eternal, toward who we are, why we're here, how we are to behave, when we focus on what all the great spiritual teachings call us toward, compassion and kindness, we're being respectful to this Eastern direction. 
The eastern direction also represents the season of the year that is spring, the element fire, and all of the Asian tribes of the earth. From the east, we head south along the red path. It's in the south that we experience our youth. We're no longer babies. In the south, we grow as young planets, trees, rocks, nations, and children. Musical scores and dance routines are practiced in the South. Papers and books are written and rewritten here. It's also in the South that we, that we develop our emotional selves. Emotion regulation is developed here in the South. When we need to put emotion into a project or a relationship, we do that kind of important work in the South. When we make sure we stay healthy in relationships, when we find our passion, when we take care of our emotional selves, we're being respectful to the Southern direction. The southern direction also represents the season of the year that is summer, the element water, and the indigenous tribes of the Americas. As we leave the southern direction and head down the black path into the west, we head down the black path into the west. It's in the west that we grow and mature as human beings, but not just human beings, because musical scores, ballets, movies, and operas are fully developed and performed in the west. Papers are published and laws are adopted here as well. It's in the West where we develop our physical selves. When we eat healthy, stay active, take care about how we treat our bodies, when we tend to the physical aspect of others, to the earth and all of its beings, we're being respectful to the Western direction. The Western direction also represents the season of the year that is fall, the element earth, and all of the African tribes of the earth. And when we leave the western direction, and we have to leave, we have to keep moving, we enter the white path and head north. The north is where the elders among us reside, our own elders who may not even reach 100 years, elder tortoises, bowhead whales, oak trees who may reach several hundred years, bristlecone pines are here when they reach several thousand years, the Cretaceous gravels of the Tuscaloosian formation are here, and they have just now reached a hundred million years. And the Methuselah star, who is 14 billion years of age, are all represented in the north. The north as well is where we grow and tend our mental selves. When we grow in knowledge, we give respect to the northern direction. It's also in the north that we, all of us, plants, animals, rocks, mountains, planets, even ideas, grow into old age and pass away. It's in the North that projects, relationships, buildings, but also bad habits, outdated ideas, and destructive social systems and useless laws end. Even when ending come, endings come though, even when our whole world is topple, we can take heart, stay on the wheel, because just as these important and beloved members of our communities pass, the new relationships, projects, ideas, and stars are just literally around the corner being born. The northern direction also represents the season of the year that is winter, the element air, and all of the Caucasian tribes of the earth. But the teaching is even more than that, because once we understand that we have all these aspects to ourselves as human beings, and that all these aspects exist within us all the time, really, and that we have all these seasons of our lives and all these tribes of the earth, and that we have all these forces of nature, then the call is to live in balance. So no one aspect of ourselves, no one season of our lives, no one race, no one force of nature, none of that is more important than the others. The human beings and the creepy crawlies and the plant beings and the water and the planets and the stars, there's not one of us who is more important or less important either. We can't survive on our mother the earth without fire and water and air. This diversity is life-giving and we won't survive without these other beings. And if we don't take heed of that, there are consequences. That also is the teaching. We are taught in that same way to make room for one another, for all of the tribes of the earth, for all of these aspects of ourselves and we too can recognize that this diversity is life-giving. If we rely too heavily on our mental capacity, and we do that lots in the academy, if we nurture our mental selves more than the other aspects of ourselves so that we are out of balance, when we neglect our emotions, our relationships will suffer. 
or when we neglect the spiritual aspect of ourselves. We may work hard, but not find any purpose in our work. And if we neglect our physical selves, our bodies will suffer. We have earth and wind and fire and water. But when we depend too heavily on just one of these elements for energy, like the earth and its oil and coal, we again are disrupting that balance. And so that's how the teaching goes. When Native students come to us, when they come here to the university, Medicine Will Teachings say that they are spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental beings coming here to spend time with us. And we can feel honored that they have come to spend time with us. And they do come to learn and grow in their mental aspects, but they don't leave those other aspects behind. They come here seeing very few people who look like them and very few people who speak their languages. Many Native ex students will experience or will have already experienced more than their fair share of that white path, the death and dying of loved ones. She lost her dad, her uncle, and her grandmother last year. She lost her mom a couple of years back. He lost his dad about three years ago. She passed. She was the mom of one of our students. And he died last year. He was an honorary native. Natives here in the South experience shorter lifespans than folks in the U.S. population. We know that because American Indians are about 2% of the population, but only half a percent of those over 65. This is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And the Mississippi Department of Human Services has reported on SARS-CoV-2 infections and deaths with 18% of Mississippi natives testing positive for the virus compared to 10% of the general population. Those are stats from the first round of the virus. And of those who tested positive, 6.1% of Mississippi natives passed, which translates into natives losing 1% of their population. Ryan, who was to be our head man in 2020, we had to, when we had to cancel the powwow, Ryan, this young man, this tradition keeper, straight dancer, drum singer, social dancer, language speaker, Ryan passed. And Joe, who started the powwow, who brought me on as co-advisor, he passed as well. In general, we live about five years shorter. Our lifespans are five years shorter than in the general population, but it's worse than that, really, because only 3.9% of Southeastern natives are in the elder category, compared to 16% of Southerners. We have numerous health disparities with fatty liver disease, alcohol, diabetes topping the list, and we are less active and eat fewer fruits than in the general population. So some of these disparities are caused by preventable chronic diseases. And we're tackling that with this Okala Achukama project, which is focused on health disparities that are related to preventable chronic diseases in Southeastern natives. Our folks rely on elders like Ryan for the transmission of culture, language, traditional eco ecological knowledge. We can't do without these people. We can't do without our elders. And so we bring about 10 native students to Southern and we train them up in health disparity research. So when they go back to their um, tribes, they know about preventable chronic diseases and they'll be better able to help in whatever way they can. We know from the Okala Achukama project that social support is a huge factor in maintaining diet and physical activity goals. So we're working to improve social support for healthy ways. We know that fatalism is problematic because people see so many people dying with diabetes that they feel like maybe diabetes is just inevitable. So we're exploring ways also to address fatalism. We've seen in other research that these medicine will teachings speak to holistic approaches to living and balance and that they've been helpful in addressing barriers to helpful ways and so maybe they'll be helpful to us as well down here. And these medicine will teachings will be helpful for our students, all our students. I know that these students need for us to understand and address them in a holistic way because I was one of those first generation students who went into the military to get money for college and the ones whose dad died when I was at college 
and the one who lost her mom when she was just 10 years old, and the one who was adopted out as a baby because my biological mom couldn't support me or my brother, my mother who was born on a houseboat and raised by the nuns in New Orleans because her mother couldn't support her, because her grandparents unknowingly signed away their property to an oil company with their ex and went to live on Al de Jean Charles in a palmetto hut like this one, the island who was a forest who could support herself and not only herself but all of her relatives, the trees and the plants and the animals and the humans like my great grandparents, but who is now almost all in the sea and whose college kids must worry about finding a new home as they study. And maybe none of that has happened to you. Maybe none of it, not even one of those things has happened to you. But medicine will teachings tell me that we can all identify with all of it. We can identify with the newness of encountering college when no one you know has been there. The being off balance like a baby who is wobbly as they learn to walk like our students encountering a totally different culture and when they are new as a motherless or fatherless child and we can all identify with the intense need to practice as we grow and learn about our independence and the back and forth that is necessary to stay fully connected to our communities and how we practice at schoolwork and practice at helping our struggling families and how we can identify with mastering schoolwork, college culture, being away from home. And we can all identify with the path of death and dying that these young folks experience way too often, way at an early age in our communities. We can call on all of our own experiences, the experiences in our own circles, and understand more completely the struggle of our communities so that we can walk together with one another on this wheel. We know that our Native students leave their families, their support systems, their communities. Some students say they've never had a friend who is not Native before coming to college, and most all of them want to return to their tribes to be of service, help support their families, and make their families proud. And I'm glad of that because Native communities need college graduates to participate in, in government, in Native government to do research on cures for diabetes, to look after tribal artifacts, to research our Southeastern American Indian symbols, to address health disparities, advocate for the protection of sacred and culturally significant lands, write grants to support language learners, be role models as teachers, pastors, psychologists, principals, attorneys, photographers, artists, dancers, morticians, microbiologists, police officers, on and on and wait we need natives to be the secretary of interior but hey we got that we need bridges between these two worlds and we need bridges between these human worlds and the worlds of our plant and animal and creepy crawly relatives so that we can understand them support them in their existence on this mother our earth we have a group of indigenous women working with we can the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, and we're building greenhouses all along our traditional trade routes so that we can help one another rediscover these relationships and live more sustainably and in balance with other beings of the earth. We're building gardens and helping other tribal folks with their indigenous gardens as well. They built this garden. Where is it? They built this greenhouse in my backyard just about a um, couple of months ago so that I can take all the seeds from the Southern Miss Medicine Wool Garden and grow them out and give or trade or sell to support our gardens. Food sovereignty is important to our tribal folks and a return to traditional eating is important to our health and plants are a huge part of that. Our garden supports other gardens like this little medicine garden in the Homa village. There's a Istri Homa or Iti Homa or a red pole in the center of that. And our Southern Medicine Will Garden, our Southern Miss Medicine Will Garden provided the seeds and many of the plants. Hi, you look home, Choctaw. 
And we need the beauty of these gardens and the stunning beauty of our native plants to remind us that no matter what, there's beauty in the world, there's hope, we can mourn our losses and be angry and tired, and then we move into this beauty, plant their seeds, and grow ourselves as we grow our gardens. We need them as well because we need to remember that there are sustainable ways to have what we need, what we want to survive and thrive. Indigenous peoples, we've been here before. Our ancestors in the recent past and yours as well, maybe further back, have experienced devastating losses from disease, migrations, famines, genocides in our short history as human beings on this earth. We've had to come together before to save ourselves and save one another. We came together recently, tribal members and others in our garden. We had a yaya, which means cry ceremony for our folks that have passed to mourn them and celebrate their lives and to help us into this transition of a new world without them. We need our ceremonies. We need one another and we need this garden. This one right here, our medicine will garden just takes our, my breath away and you can come visit. It's free. It's open. It's nothing stopping you from parking in the parking lot. You can Google her um, and it'll tell you where she's located. And we need these gardens to help restore what's been taken from the land, like the trees and plants that form protection from floods, both for one another and for us, protection from the damaging winds of hurricanes, protection from this warming of our world. We need their help in restoring what has been taken from ourselves, from all of us, that connection that sustains us, the shade, our food, our medicine, our furniture, our very breath. We need these gardens because where my people come from or where they're living right now, the Huma, they live at the end of the world and it's a dangerous place there and it's a beautiful place there. I wanna thank you for spending this time with me and I wanna thank Southern Miss for tolerating our, our um, forest garden on campus and we can for supporting this bridge with our plant relatives through the greenhouses and Embre for supporting the bridge building with our native communities and for their focus on health disparities as we move towards more healthy and sustainable and longer lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy. Um, um, thank you, Tammy, so much, so much. Um, for sharing that with us and, and taking us through that with you. Um, it was That was wonderful and really, um, a great learning experience to know what's going on there and, and the work that you've been doing and that communities have been doing. Um, so I do want to remind our audience, um, and thank you to Afton for putting in the chat, but um, if you have any questions, um, please send those in through the chat. And uh, we also um, have the ability, if you'd like to join us in conversation, um, that you we can have you unmute and ask a question as well to Tambi. Um, so please do. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, feel free to put them in the chat um, and I'm happy to ask them or if you feel comfortable, you can join us in conversation. Um, but Tammy, I thought just to get us started off as people start writing in their questions, um, I think it's, uh, maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about how you, I guess, entered into the conversation with the University of Southern Mississippi to create these gardens on campus. Cause I think that's an incredible project um, and I think one that seemed really necessary. Um, so maybe if you could tell us how it all came about, how those conversations get started. Well, um, so when I became the, uh, when Joe brought me in as a faculty advisor, I had a friend down here who was a Choctaw woman and she had a elder in the Choctaw community who she was friends with. And she said, why don't we start a center 
Um, so we went and I said, yeah, that would be not me that could do that, but you could do that as a student and as a, as a separate nation and as, you know, your territory here, you could make that happen. So we all ganged up and we went over to the provost's office and we were like, uh, you know, uh, the, these guys want for us to start a center to develop relationships with these tribes because we're really not doing much of anything with these tribes right now. And, and they need, you know, resources that come from academic communities. And so uh, the administration listened and they said, sure, yeah, that's a good idea. And then why don't you form a minor? So we have a center and a minor in American Indian Studies. And then with the garden, I knew the guy that was the CFO at the time, and he was very, um, uh, he understood our the situation we were in we're, we're like hardly there's you know two percent of the population are native and so we really don't have a lot of people to have a big voice and so i went to him and i said you know we want to build a garden and, and he said okay sure and i said um do you have space and i thought he would put us out you know in the boondocks like just because usm has like you know woods basically too and i thought okay he's gonna put us in the woods and we're gonna have but we're gonna do it anyway because that's a place to you know to grow our native plants and to learn about them and have the elders come and teach and he brought me over to that space that you saw on campus and he said what about this and i went for real he said yes he said but you're gonna have to tend it and i said okay so that's how it happened. It happened through the provost office, the center and the minor, and through the CFO um, who gave us the space. I guess that wasn't, you know, the typical way things happen, but that's the way this happened. Thank you. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. And, um, and really great that they didn't put you in the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Oh, great. We have a question. So um, I want to share this with you, Tammy. And I'm sorry if I'm having some feedback. I'm trying to figure out what this is on my end and the feedback. Um, but maybe if you could share what has been the biggest surprise that's resulted from creating the garden? The, I just can't even tell. Let me. I, I can't even tell you like how the garden okay so when we developed the garden let me just tell you this part when we get developed the garden joe and i didn't know anything about native plants but you know my dad was a gardener and so i was like oh i can figure this out so we just we just put plants in there any old kinds of plants in there to save the space because i do know that everything will come in there and grow if we don't you know put something down in the in the dirt but I would go around when I would go recruiting or to the Choctaw Indian Fair, anywhere I would go around with this board and I would put a big picture of the medicine wall garden right in the middle of the board. And when people would ask me, what is that? I would say, well, that's our medicine wall garden, but it's really not what I want. It's not how we, we envisioned it yet. I said, we're still working on it. And you know, we want it to be populated with native plants and we want for it to uh, be a teaching garden for people about these native plants and about the original names of these plants. And people would be like, oh, that's cool. And every once in a while, somebody would be like, oh, okay, I can give you five native plants. And I'd be like, sure, awesome, great. And we would put them in the garden. And then one day I was at the Choctaw Indian Fair, I believe it was in 2008, I was in, or 2009, I was at the Choctaw Indian Fair and I had my little thing and I did my little spiel. And basically what I was doing was holding that intention in front of me all the time. My intention is to turn this into a native plant garden. It's going to be a native plant garden. It may happen in 10 years. It may happen, you know, but it's going to be a native plant garden. So I went to the Choctaw Indian Fair and these two elderly people from Oxford were at the fair and they had gone to the restroom and my little booth was right by the restroom. And they come out, one, the lady comes out first and she says, um, you know what you got there and I said that's the medicine will garden but it's not like it's supposed to be and I told her my intention about it being a native plant garden and her husband came out of the restroom and so they started talking they said we've heard of that garden and I'm like for real and they're like yeah they were native plant enthusiasts 
I said, for real? And she's like, yeah. And I said, um, oh, okay. And they're talking and she goes, you know, I think we can help you with that. And I said, okay. And I thought five plants, right? Five more plants. That's cool. Five more plants. And she says, I'm going to come down there. We're going to come down there and see it um, in about a month. And so in August, they came down with a, in a, um, a sequoia, which is a huge, you know, car itself with pulling a flatbed trailer with 500 native plants. And they, in one weekend, we totally repopulated that garden with native plants, even dug up the ones that weren't native and put them in my yard. And over one weekend, I had a native plant garden and that was the beginning. And that's who I was gonna go visit up there. If I had come in person, I was gonna go stay with her cause we're still friends and we still, you know, troubleshoot the garden and talk about native plants. So yeah, so that was a shock that it turned, you know, it's like that intention was like one weekend turned that intention into a reality. That was the biggest shock I've really ever had. But this guy had told me, he said, you know, Tammy, don't give up. A lot of people give up right before they turn the corner. And that always stayed in my mind right before it happens. They're all giving up, you know, and it, it never happens for them. And so that always stayed in my mind. So I always just kept the intention and kept the patience and then boom, it was, it happened. That's awesome. That's, yes. Turn the corner. Um, we have a, a question from Katie McKee in the chat. Um, so thank you, Tammy, uh, for the poetry that goes with the garden and the different paths in it. Um, she would like to know more about Native students at Southern Miss. Are they part of a student organization? Are they mainly from the Southeast? Um, and do they tend the garden? Yes, all of those. <laughs> they are mainly from the Southeast, although right now I have a graduate student who's Ojibwe from Minnesota. Um, but. And she actually came here because she did her thesis in Honolulu, Hawaii on medicinal gardens and featured ours as one of the ones. Um, but so they come from all over the place, but mostly from the Southeast. So right now, I mean, we've had students from the Jenna Band of Choctaw Indians, from my tribe, the Huma, from lots of Choctaws from the Mississippi band. We've, we've got a student right now from the um, Porch Creek tribe. Um, so uh, we've got one from the Muscogee Nation. Um, I, that's all I can think of right now. Um, but so, yeah, mostly from the Southeast. Um, they belong to the Golden Eagles and the ones who want to join, join the Golden Eagles in our tribal society. We're fundraising, they're fundraising right now for my tribe down there who got hit by that hurricane. So all of the, that destruction video was me flying over in a helicopter, taking pictures of our tribal properties with, with you know, our people not able to really go back home yet at all because their houses are destroyed. But so they belong to the Golden Eagles. Yes, they do. We were out there the other day. What were we doing? We were tending the garden. What were we doing? Um, pulling up, um, oh, this bad grass got in the garden. So they were out there pulling up this bad grass. And then we have a day set where we're gonna, those paths now look, they have a fair amount of black on them. They need to be, what do you call that? Um, pressure washed. And so we got a day, <laughs> where we're gonna all go out there and pressure wash those paths for the, for the um, to make them look better, maybe repaint them, you know. We get out there and paint rocks, like we have a rock in the middle of the garden right now representing all those children from um, those schools that they found in graveyards up in uh, Canada, the boarding schools. So we do, we do a fair amount in that garden, yes. Was there another question, was there something else? Yes, um, but, but you know, you, you answered about tending to the garden. Yes, um, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, maybe just adding on to that, um, Afton sent in a question. Um, you mentioned earlier in your talk about, um, I think about 10 Native students that um, are admitted to, the, uh, to Southern Miss. Um, is there like any scholarships or specific uh, 
programs that are there to support Native students on campus? Well, this is a summer program. The Okala Achukama Project is a summer program supported by Embre, um, which is training, you know, students in, in uh, uh, health related fields. Well, and they do pay them. They pay all the students in the, that program and in the other programs. So they come here for the summer um, just for that program and they are paid and they're housed in the dorms and they come over to my house once a week and eat and hang out and play and yeah so we have a it's a, it's a good a good time and it's a good program and it's something that they can do that put on their vita they end up with a paper uh, a poster presentation at the end so something for their vita as well it sounds like maybe going off of that too and and please um uh, folks please continue to add any questions that you have for tammy um, I was wondering, thinking about that, you talked a lot about, um, you know, health disparities, what's going on for Native communities here um, in Mississippi. And so thinking about here at the University of Mississippi, but thinking about publics, private universities in the state, um, how can we better be supporting um, as staff and as faculty, Native students who come to our institutions, but as well, even those who are not yet coming to our institutions? I had, we had a group of, every once in a while, I'll get like a red flag going on with some of the students. And I got that um, a few years ago with a, with a few students and they were saying things like, um, the, and they report to me pretty regularly, but mostly it, you know, it, it can be resolved easily. But they reported that people were making fun of the shoes they were wearing, because they're wearing, which is what everybody's wearing now, like socks and slides. And that's typical on their reservation. And so socks and slides. And people were looking at them funny and they were getting just this sense like they don't, they, they don't, you know, they're not fitting in. They're not welcome. They're not fitting in. And they got that sense. And so at about the same time, someone asked me if I would go and speak in the dorm to, you know, the people in the dorm, the students in the dorm. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. So we all gathered up and we all went. And so my students are back there in back of me and the dorm students are out here sitting down. There were like about 50 of them. And I said, okay. And I huddled up with my, and you know, we talked and I introduced and like that. And then I huddled up with my students. And this is what I think it takes every once in a while. I huddled up and I said, I want you to go around. I want you to shake hands. In, or greet these students in the most respectful way you possibly can, like your, like your Popeney would greet a, a, a celebrity, a, um, a dignitary in the most respectful way you can. And so they did. They went around, eyes cast down, no eye contact, very, uh, very soft handshake. They went around and they greeted every one of these students with their eyes cast down and a soft handshake. And then they came back and back at me and I said, okay, so what do you guys think? How do you think they feel about you? And nobody said anything. And I said, do, do you feel like these students want to get to know you? And these students from the dorm were like, no, they don't care nothing about us. They didn't look at us. They didn't even, they didn't, they didn't hardly touch us. They don't care anything about us. I just felt like they didn't want to have anything to do. And my students in the back, their mouths were open because they had just delivered the most respectful greeting they could possibly imagine. And so we talked about that, about how that kind of a judgment, both ways, either way, um, can set us off immediately sideways on the wrong path. And, my, and then we laughed about it because that's so crazy that that little thing right there had determined for them that, that our, my students didn't care anything about them. And my students were trying to be totally respectful. And, you know, so that kind of thing I think needs to happen regularly and also maybe build it into the, because cultural differences exist and misunderstandings happen because of cultural differences. And so helping these kids navigate that and, 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 you know, bridge that gap for them, because I was, I'm in both worlds and I knew what was going on. I knew exactly what was going to happen in that. 
but so I was like the bridge holding both of these worlds and going, come on now, you know, that's a mistake. That's just a misunderstanding. That's all it is. And that helped my students because they thought it was, you know, just something else. And it was just a misunderstanding of, of, of what they were presenting, you know. So we need we need it with all students. So misunderstandings you know, can be avoided, but also they can be remedied or, or, or worked out, you know? I think that would help. Thank you, Tammy, for that um, and sharing that story too. Um, I think um, another question maybe leading off of that, and, and we have, I know we have a couple more minutes for questions. Um, and I know Afton's been putting in um, about the South Talks in the chat, but please, if any last questions from anyone. Um, but I did want to ask you, Tammy, about uh, what has Southern Miss done well with local tribes and communities that students want to attend Southern Mississippi or see themselves there. Um, I think I've had some recent conversations with some native students here who um, said it felt very weird to come here because their communities didn't think of this as a place to attend, um, the University of Mississippi specifically. Um, so wondering what, what, what are the bridges? What are the connections that Southern Miss has done well that you've seen? Um, they have a native person on campus as a faculty member who opens her house and makes sure that if there's a, a misunderstanding, these kids know that they can, they know that when they come here, they will not be hungry. They will not, not have a place to sleep if something happens. You know, if they get in the car and try to go home and they don't have any money, I'll lay a $10 bill on them and let them fill up with gas. You know what I mean? They have another native who, and we need to look for these people and put them in these strategic positions because they come from these communities and they understand these kids and it's not a big deal to give a $10 bill to a kid who needs to get home. And they all want to go home on the weekends and they're just kids. So of course they overspend and of course they do all the things that kids do. But having somebody in that position who, um, who has that experience and Okay, and if that's not possible because we're only half a percent of the entire, you know, force of uh, academics, if that's not possible, then I would suggest getting a, um, like a grandma, somebody, a pokney, somebody from the reservation or from nearby. You guys are probably closer to Henning, Tennessee. So you could get your pokney from Henning, Tennessee somebody that makes an appearance every once in a while, somebody that gathers up with these kids and encourages them and tells them they're proud of them. And oh my gosh, I know it's hard, but you can do it like that. Because that's from their reservation. Henning is the, the most Northern reservation that, that um, the Mississippi band has over here. Also, sometimes they come in and they're not as um, well, they're not as uh, ready for the math classes and the writing classes. And so there needs to be a way that is just easy going that can say, you know, if you need to jump into a class that can better prepare you for these regular classes, we got you on that. And, and, and because otherwise there's gonna be a flunk out factor and yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I think, um, so if there are, I'm not seeing, let me see. I think we may have. There's some questions. Yes, there. yes. Thank you. I was just going to that. I saw it pop up. Thank you, Afton. Um, so a couple questions for you. Um, uh, how have the Native American students influenced the culture of Southern Mississippi? Um, yeah, if you can share with us a little bit. They, you know, what's really funny, um, there's a, them coming over to my house has been attractive to other students who want to come over to my house and, you know, hang out and shoot bows and arrows and, play, you know, watch these native TV shows and movies and stuff. So, 
and also they ha they have a um you know a, a there's a thing about being raised like sort of traditionally i guess where there's a huge like observation period for anything so like even when i go somewhere like if i go into a meeting you know how when you go into a faculty meeting or something and everybody's like G -g 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 -g, and everybody's trying to get their voice in and they're trying to get their my reserve my thing is to stand back and listen for a long time <laughs> And that's what they do too. A lot of them do that too. And and so they get to know like what's going on pretty well because they're standing back and they're watching like they're observing for a long time. And I think some of these students like that. And so, so you know, they end up in the native group. Right now our native group is only about half native. The rest of them are something else. So, so that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. And maybe so, um, and one more question from Barbara Phillips that I'd love to share, just hear from your, your thoughts, Tammy. Um, you've shared with us a lot of kind of some of the personal, the personal responses on campus and from your area of work to student needs. Um, but maybe could you share a little bit more about like, what would we like, what would you like to see? What do we think could be seen as more transformation, you know, institutional transformation on campus? we have like traditionally when people there's a couple of things that are native like that are native like native that um i think would facilitate us having better institutions one we, we're all obsessed with this voting thing so it's like you know to put a person on a committee um, you know, basically their friends get together and go, we want that person on the committee and they'll vote that person onto the committee. Well, what that means is that the same faces and the same voices appear all the time. And that sort of leaves everybody else out. Well, if you do that in a native community, you'll be like not elected again because, because these people that are left out, they're going to know that, you know, and so I think a better, you know, sometimes I'm watching what we do and I also think that lends itself to having, you know, the same voices, the same people, the same ideas. And in order to increase that diversity of voices and lenses and ideas, I think a better option would be like either what you know, we do in our communities, which is you just bring everybody that you can in, or you just do a random selection of people and put them on that committee, because there's not a one of us that's not undereducated, you know, there's not a one of us that can't serve on academic council, graduate council, this, that, the multicultural, whatever, you know, it's just not true that we need our friends along with us or the same people over and over. And I think that would increase and increase the diversity because right now what I see at least at our university is same people same voices same ideas same right like that and and um and I think that happens everywhere churches you know just pretty much everywhere I just see it because we got that election thing going and election things are about popularity and popularity is about people like you well that just automatically excludes a bunch of people right there you know <laughs> so that's that and what was the other thing? So what could we be doing at the university? I think also what I see at universities is that um, diversity is like a black and a white issue. It's like there's two different aspects to diversity. And, and like brown people aren't even considered in that as diverse as diverse. It's, it's got to be just two aspects. And I see a lot of that as well on university campuses. And you know, diversity is a weird thing. It's like in, our tri in some of our tribes, people who have like um, what we would call disabilities like autism or something like that are considered, sometimes they're like almost revered because those people, unlike me, I see things a certain way. You probably see the same thing in a similar way as I do. But that one, that one sees the world totally differently. Now, how valuable is that? That's like a huge gift to be able to see the world in a totally different way. And I think in our universities, we value 
not diversity. We say that. Our words say that all the time. We're saying that. But if you look at people, if you look at what's on, what's out there, it's more like um, if you're extroverted, that's valued. If you're introverted, that's not. If you speak up, that's valued. If you don't, that's not. If you, you know, there are a lot of kooky, weird people that we would call, you know, that have huge things to say and do and huge you know, um, gifts to bring. And we got to open our minds to them too. And, and I see us not doing that in the academy. And actually I see it getting less and less diverse. Like, it's almost like the more we talk about it, the less and less diverse we actually are. We're just talking about it more. I see that in our academy. I do. Thank you, Tammy. So I think um, we are, we're at one o'clock and so I'm gonna turn it over to Katie um, just to close us out. Let me just say thank you to everybody for coming. I think Afton has put some information into the chat about the things that we have coming up next week. Next week in particular, we'll be talking about Stephen Monroe's new book, Heritage and Hate. So we hope that we'll be able to see all of you at that event and others coming up soon, including the Gilder Jordan Lecture, which is actually next week on the 21st. So thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Tammy and Sarah. We hope to see you again. <laughs>